How y'all doing? Doing pretty good. Right, hello on Facebook Live. Good evening. Come on in. Let me know that you're there. Hey, Apostle Kraft, how you doing? Good to see you. Hope everybody has had a great day. We'll wait until a little after our appointed time. Hey, Tanya, how you doing, my sister? Good to see you. Hey, Diane. Hey, Loriana. Hope everybody's had a great day. Go ahead and share. Let folks know we're on. Have a good lesson on the fog, the favor of God tonight. As we are in this ninth month, it's amazing how fast the year has gone. Go ahead and share. Let people know we're on so that we can have a good class for tonight. Dr. Pace, good to see you, sir. Don't forget if you're in town this weekend, everyone, we're kicking off my third pastoral. Thank you, Apostle. I have my third pastoral appreciation starting on Friday night. Archbishop Ruth, uh, Ruth Smith, W. Smith will be with us from Light of the World, my the Bishop, along with the Light of the World family. It's going to be a great time. Then Sunday morning, I have Dr. Daniel Smart, a good friend of mine from Edgefield Baptist Church in Fayetteville, will be closing us out. Also, be uh, releasing my second book, Hope to Make It Not a Shame, Volume Number One. I will have copies um, on site Friday and Sunday, so please um, also purchase that book. It's a great read. As I was going back through it with my publisher, um, Charlotte Dudley, I was just blessed all over again by what was in it. So please make sure you avail yourself to that on Friday or Sunday and it'll be available on my website in a couple of weeks Hi, hello to everyone that's coming in, Pastor Anthony good to see you, Queen Mother good to see you if you have your Bible you can go ahead and go with me to Genesis 18 I'm going to get your notepads and get ready I'm going to give some great information on tonight Yes, I can imagine I will be praying for the Virgin Islands and praying for anyone who has relatives in any of the areas that's been impacted by Hurricane Irma. You want to definitely pray and cover them. Absolutely. Hey, Yolanda, how you doing? Good evening. Yes, I pray for you, Queen Mother. All right. There's power in prayer. Hello, my sister. Good to see you, Kawana. All right, let's go ahead and get started. And those that will join in, will join in later. Good evening, Latoya. Good to see you. Let's go ahead and pray. Our Father in God, we bless you and we thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence. We thank you for how you've kept us all day long, for your provision, for your kindness, for your protection. And now, Father, as we take this time, as we set aside this time to pray, and to hear the word, we ask God that you would meet us in such a strong, tangible way. I declare and decree, God, that the cloud of your presence will begin to manifest wherever the listeners are in a way that the power and the presence of God will overshadow. I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that you would take me, your servant, and use me as a vessel of honor. Take my intellect, studies, experiences, passions, and struggles, and use it to its optimum level. Take it, God, and allow it to... Uh, be a conduit through which this word can come forth with power, clarity, and relevance. And we thank you that you have authority over the airways. We send the breakers anointing, God, to go before me, God, that will allow 
that there be an unhindered flow of this teaching tonight. We give you great praise and honor in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to another life class from Dr. David Jackson. It's always a pleasure to be able to share the word of the Lord with you. Uh, we are in an exciting season at Mount Sinai, or what we call affectionately the Mount, as we have come out of a whole month of commanding our morning. But we're still commanding our mornings uh, that you are continuing to command your morning and also commanding our nights. We're just declaring and decreeing all day long and just believing God for manifestation in our lives. And we have moved now into the month of, of September and discussing the favor of God. And so it's very important that we study the favor of God because a lot of people use that word and I think they use it incorrectly. They use it too lightly. And so I thought it was important to spend some time teaching on the favor so that we can know what it is, how to access it, and then to understand what it is that favor brings into our life. There's a wonderful scripture in Psalms 106 verse 4 that I want to share with you also that you can begin to Add this to your list of declarations. It's important to have scriptures that you can constantly declare over your life every day. And you should be declaring the favor of God over your life every day. If you are a covenant believer, a kingdom believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have access to his favor. And you want to declare that over your life every single day. And so that's in Psalms 106 verse 4. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have towards your people. Oh, visit me with your salvation. Thank you, Yolanda, for putting that up. Psalms 106, verse 4. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have towards your people. Oh, visit me with your salvation. Hey, Gerald, all the way from Kampala, Uganda. Good to see you, man. All right? So you get up in the mornings, you should just declare. And notice that there is a favor that God has towards his people because you are his people, because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a seed. You are the seed of Abraham. You are a son of Abraham. And so the same covenant blessings that was promised to Israel is yours as being a part of spiritual Israel. Declare it every day. Our main text for the night, however, is going to come from Genesis 18. So hopefully you're already there in Genesis 18. So when we say the word favor... It means a number of things, but the primary meaning of favor, and some of this is going to be a review from Sunday. The primary meaning of favor is grace, right? And grace is unmerited favor. Unmerited there means that it cannot be earned, okay? It cannot be earned. It is merely given out of God's unconditional love for us. So we did nothing to earn this. There's nothing we could have done to deserve or undeserve this this is merely given to us by God's own prerogative. Uh, he loves us. He's chosen us. And there are, you know, and I had to, to clarify this on Sunday. I'm not trying to suggest that God doesn't love everybody. He loves everybody. He loves his entire creation. He sent his son Jesus into the world to because he loved us, right? That's what St. John 3 says. We all say, for God so loved the word that he gave, right? So he clearly loves the world and he loves his creation. He will save those who are to be saved. All of that is true. At the same time, we must acknowledge that God has, there's certain people that God really loves and that he really gives special grace towards, right? Look at the whole story of Abraham of all of the people that were alive in Abraham's time, why did God select Abraham? Think about it. Why did God select Abraham? Just think about that for a second. All right? It's getting dark. I want to make sure you can see me. All right? Why did God choose Abraham out of all of the people? Because he selected him. He decided that this was going to be the man that I was going to make a covenant with to continue my purposes in the earth. He could have chose any person, but he chose Abraham. Why? Because he could. He's God. And he chooses who he wants to choose to fulfill his purpose. It's the same with you and me today. And I want you to receive that in your spirit, that God, out of all of the millions of people in the world, has selected you and me to be in a special relationship with, to do special things for, to do things for that he's not doing for everybody. You should be very uh, honored and humbled, actually. When I think of God's favor in my life, it humbles me that 
he's doing stuff for me that he's not doing for everybody. And sometimes you can begin to curse the favor in your life by speaking negatively over it or being ashamed of it because everybody in your life or who's around you may not have it. And even if everybody around you has the favor, they may not have the same degree of favor, right? That you're walking in, right? Can you can you can you say amen to that? That there's people around you who may have favor, but they don't have the same level of favor that you're walking in and that you're operating in. Okay. And so it's unmerited favor. You have not deserved it. You don't earn it. And uh, that favor there really means good gifts, right? Grace is good gifts, right? And so when you put it together, it is good gifts that you and I do not deserve, right? And we have seen that in our life. I'm sure you've seen that in your life where you may have gotten a car knowing that you didn't have the credit or the appropriate amount of down payment according to what the car industry says you must have. You've gotten houses and you didn't have the correct credit score or you've gotten a job and you didn't have the appropriate credentials or educational background. Some of y'all have been in, you know, you're married to a person that you never thought in a million years you would actually find because they're such a great person. They actually was who was on your list if you have a list and God has been faithful in checking off the, you know, checking off the marks on your list. I'm sorry, I have, I'm having a, a sundown invasion here. <laughs> I want to make sure you can see me. Hold on. The sun is all in my face, but it's all good. We're going to adjust because I want you to be able to see me and hear what I'm saying. All right. So there's a lot of things that we have in our life that we don't deserve to have, but God has given it to us because he loves us and out of his favor for us. And we know that if it had not been God that gave it to us, we certainly wouldn't have it, right? We certainly wouldn't have it. And you know that it's favor because when you try to make sense of it in the natural and you cannot, the only explanation you could come up with is that this is what God has done. Like God did this. God gave this to me. And it blows my mind to see how much God has done in my life. And, you know, if you really stop and look at your background, you know the fact that God even brought you out of where you came from is a sign of his favor. Because some of us wasn't even supposed to live this long. We wasn't even supposed to survive this long. And, 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 and if you think about the word curses that people have spoken over your life and told you you wasn't going to be nothing. You wasn't going to have nothing. And you're going to be just like your daddy or just like your mama or just like your uncle. You know, speak, people speak these word curses over us and try to t speak generational curses over us and try to try to tell us what we are and what we're not going to be. But thanks be to God for his favor on our life that breaks us out of even word curses that's been put on us, that takes us to places that people never thought we could go. Now, you know, it's so funny when, when God takes you places that people said you couldn't go, then they see you years later walking in the favor of God and they want to stand up in your face and lie. Oh, I knew you was going to be something. Oh, I just knew you were going to make it. And no, you spoke and said I wasn't. And now you want to look me in my face and tell me that you knew it. It's a lie, right? But thanks be to God that it doesn't matter what people say or don't say. It don't matter if people want to co-sign or don't co-sign. God and himself is the majority. He doesn't need the assistance and the approval of people. That's what makes him the super judge. <laughs> That's what makes him Elohim. He is a God and a committee and a council all by himself. And we thank God that he made a decision in the council of his mind concerning you and me that we were going to be his, that we were going to go far, that we're going to have more than we even thought we could ever have because his favor on our life gives us stuff we don't deserve, but it also breaks rules for you. That's how you get the good gifts. You don't deserve it so that he breaks rules to give you what you don't deserve. That's how you got the house, right? The credit rule was such and such. But God moved upon somebody. There was a program out there that could help you. There was somebody who had compassion for you and felt that it was your time to get a house. And they broke the rules to get you there. Not illegally, but they knew loopholes in the rules. Come on. To get you to where you need to be. That's how you got the job. You don't have the education, but you have the experience. Right. You have these skills to get the job done, even though you don't have the degree, because how many of you know you can have a degree and still can't get the job done? 
But ha, you have the experiences, you have the gifts, and you got the Holy Spirit on your side, and it gives you the ability to get the job done, even though you don't have the degree. You know that you don't qualify based upon the world standard. But remember, you and I are kingdoms, kingdom people. We're not citizens of the earth. We just live here, right? We are ambassadors in the territory of the earth. But our citizenship is in the kingdom of heaven, is in the kingdom of God. And so we are not governed by the rules of the earth, but we must abide by the rules of the earth. I hope you didn't, hope you didn't miss that, right? We're not governed by the rules of the earth, but we must abide by the rules of the earth. We are governed by the rules of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God operates differently than the kingdom of the earth, right? So we must know the difference. And in the kingdom of God, he will bend his own rules. Now, why does God bend his rules to get you what you need? Because God has made promises to us. And God is very serious about his covenant relationships and his promises towards us to the point that he will break things. He will move things. He will shift things. He will turn people's hearts to facilitate you getting past the barriers that's blocking you so that you can continue to move to the place where you are supposed to be. So in many ways, favor is a barrier breaker. It removes barriers. It removes things that block you from moving smoothly to where you need to go. And the biggest thing that we as favor people must embrace is that God is going to do stuff for us that people are going to see and say, that's not fair. Right? That's why we say favor ain't fair. Because people will look at you like, how did you get that? That doesn't make sense. That's not right. You know, uh, what makes you better than me? It's not about I'm better than you. It's just that God chose to do stuff for me that he's not doing for you. I can't explain it. I can't, I can't justify it. It's just that God made a decision to do stuff for me he's not doing for you. And if you're not careful, people will make you feel bad and make you hate that you're favored. But don't let anyone make you feel bad for the fact that God is doing stuff for you he's not doing for other people. God is doing stuff for you that he's not even thinking about doing for your neighbor. He's just not, and he's not going to do it. I, I've had people I've seen, you know, in ministry, college and ministry, and, you know, I'll get up and go forth, and the anointing would be there, and God would move with signs and wonders. And, and I'm just like, who just, it's just David, little old David, and God would take me and use me to do great things. And then I see other people who are way more articulate and have more information, have more revelation than I have. And they get up and talk. It sounds great, but there's no power. There's no anointing. There's no signs and wonders. And I would be like, well, God, why is it that you anointed me and <laughs> you haven't anointed them? He says, I anoint who I want to anoint. I use who I want to use, right? I bless who I want to bless because I'm God. I don't have to give an account to people. I don't have to give an account to anybody for what I do. I can do what I want to do. So listen, stop. Stop trying to hide your favor. Stop trying to um, explain your favor. You're trying to explain to people. You're trying, some of y'all are playing down your favor so that you don't intimidate people who can't stand the fact that you've got favor. And see, we can't live like that. Favor is going to make you stand out anyway. Some of y'all trying to lower your head and bow so people don't see the favor. But when you have favor, it's going to make you stand out. You're not going to be like everybody else. You don't fit in because God is doing conspicuous things in your life. That's a good word. Conspicuous things in your life, meaning he's doing things that cannot be easily hidden. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for some conspicuous blessings. <laughs> I'm ready for some conspicuous opportunities. I'm ready for some conspicuous experiences to happen in my life. And I'm not ashamed of the fact that God did it for me, even though you may not think I deserve it. Even though you think that I don't qualify, even though you know my little bits, it don't matter what you know about me, baby. All you need to know is that regardless of what I've been through and what I may go through, I'm still been favored by the almighty God. Hallelujah. You should be confident tonight. Not arrogant, but confident because you know you did nothing to get what you're getting. It was merely out of God's providence and his love for you and his commitment to covenant that you have what you have. 
So when you say you have the favor of God, that means that God is doing good things for you you don't deserve. He's breaking rules to accommodate and facilitate what he has promised. You have goodwill with him and you are acceptable to him. And that's another thing. When we say we have the favor of God, that means that we are accepted in him, which means that we don't have to seek the approval of man. Some of us are squandering our favor because we're too busy trying to impress people. We're too busy trying to convince people to like us. And we're too busy trying to convince people to accept us for who we are. No, when you have the favor of God, that means that if nobody else accepts me, for the greatness that's in me, I know that God does. Now, that doesn't give you licensure to be obnoxious and no one can get along with you. That's not what I'm saying because that's not a sign of favor. That's not even Christian behavior. I mean that people may not want to acknowledge that God is breaking rules for your life. You don't become um, unconfident, if that's a word, in the fact that you have favor. You just hold your head up and know that, hey, I'm a king's kid and because I'm accepted in him, I don't have to worry about having to be accepted by people who don't want to accept the fact that I have something they don't have. Okay. So in studying favor, I want us to pay attention to where, Hey, Mary, good to see you. I want us to pay attention to what favor is in the Bible. Again, this is a review for those who are at church and we're going to get to some stuff we didn't talk about on Sunday. So bear with me for the review. I want to make sure that we're all on the same equal footing here. So in order to accurately study favor, we are in Genesis 18. We're going to start at verse number one. This is where it's first mentioned in the Bible. And so I talked about the law of first mention, right? So I want to make sure that we're studying uh, the first place that favor is mentioned. In the text, we see mention of Abram, right? God comes to Abram in Genesis chapter 12. Write that down. Genesis chapter 12, one to three, right? He comes to him and says, listen, I want to establish a covenant with you. I want to build a relationship with you. But in order to fulfill this relationship, you're going to have to leave where you are, right? Go ahead. Excuse me. Sorry. That was my God, sir. All right. I'll call him back after life class. All right. So he tells him to leave his family, leave his country. I go to a place I will show you, right? He gives him some great promises. He says, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to barack you, which means I'm going to speak well of you. I'm going to salute you. I'm going to make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Okay. These are the promises that God makes to Abraham in building the relationship with him. I want you to note that he has made some great promises to Abram, but there are going to be a number of things that Abraham is going to go through that's going to seemingly hinder the fulfillment of what he says. The main one is that Abram and Sarai don't have children by this point. They're old up in age, right? They're past the childbearing age, but God says, I'm going to make you a great nation or to be a nation you have to have children, right? And so here it is that you don't have the natural ability to produce children, but God is saying, I'm still gonna bless you. And your children's 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 children are gonna be blessed, they're gonna burst out, they're gonna spread out, the same word we use for the breakers anointing, they're gonna burst out to the west, the east, the north, and the south, and they're going to dominate. With no children and no natural ability to produce, God is making this promise. So now you see why favor is important. Because God has made some promises to you and me that in our natural ability, we don't see how it's going to even be possible. But God says that I'm not going to make a promise to you and not fulfill it, even if I have to do it supernaturally and by divine means. Even if I have to shift, break, and change the rules I put in place of the natural, I will do that so that the promises I've made to you will be fulfilled and manifest in your life. Hey, my brother Paul, right? That's what God promises to do. And we have to learn how to trust that. We can't be so governed by what we see and what we have and what we think we know. Hey, Francis Window, we have to trust that if God promised it to us, that God is surely going to bring it to pass. And he does not have to move by what we have and don't have, what we see and don't see. We have to trust him, right? That's why it's important to know his promises over your life. So he obeys, he leads, he eventually ends up in Canaan in the plains of Mamre, right? And he gets to Mamre. Mamre means fatness or strength. God declared the decree to you that God is bringing you to a fat place, a place full of strength. Of, and the fatness there means a, a, a overflow. There's so much that it's caused your space to expand. It's caused your space to, um, to increase and spread. 
You'll come into so much increase that you're about to spread. And the spread is going to give you strength. Some of y'all need God to increase you and spread you and give you strength. And I'm declaring that you're coming into your memory place. In this place, God speaks to him. In Genesis 15, 1 through 5, he reaffirms his covenant. When God increases you, he reaffirms his covenant. That's a good thing to remember. When God increases you, when he elevates you, when he promotes you, he will always remind you of his covenant. And then he also begins to augment. He adds some things that he didn't tell you. Now, God knows the full covenant agreement that he has with you, but he rolls them out in phases. Because if God really told you everything he's going to do for you, it may overwhelm you. It may overwhelm you. So God will strategically roll out everything that he's going to do for you as you get to key points in your journey that he will reaffirm his covenant and ask some stuff. Once he got to Mamre, right, the place of fatness and strength, he begins to speak to him about his seed, right, that you're going to have a child out of your loins, right? You, you don't have to get a surrogate a wife. You don't have to get no assistance from anybody else. I am going to bring this child out of your loins, Abram and Sarai. And so um, 15.6 says that because Abraham believed the Lord, it was counted to him as righteousness. So in order to truly walk in divine favor, you have to believe God, despite the lack of evidence. If you want to see it to believe it, then faith is not going to really work in your life at the way in the way that God wants it to work. You have to believe it when there is no proof, when there is no evidence, when there is no logical, natural means for this to happen. You have to say that I believe the word of God so much that I will take God at his word and I choose to believe what God has says over and above what I see in the natural. You have to make that decision. If you don't make that decision, then you're going to constantly be trapped and imprisoned by the fact that you don't have enough money for it and you don't have enough credit for it and you don't have enough connections to get there. You don't know anybody. Nobody will give you a chance. And all these things in the natural that can cause us to question if God's going to do what he said he's going to do. That faith is what's going to push you into the right standing to receive and be postured in position to receive what God has for you. And so now we're in 18, where Abram is in the plains of memories in his tent, all right? And he sees three men walking by, right? He sees three men walking by. This is in 18 verse two. He sees them walking by. He runs out of his tent door and bows himself down and then we begin to see the interaction with favor in verse three, all right? And then he says, my lords, if I've now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant, all right? So this is the first time we see the word favor in the Bible. And so in our first, uh, the, our law of first mention, we want to begin to dig in here and understand what favor is. And then that sets the, the foundation for how we understand and use favor throughout the rest of the Bible, but also how we use favor in our own life. So let's make a couple of notes. Sunday, I said that favor doesn't identify itself. You have to identify it, right? Favor does not identify itself. You have to identify and know that it's favor, which means that favor could be passing by you right now. But if you cannot discern that this is a favor opportunity, it will pass you by, right? How do you know that you are in the presence of favor? What is it that made Abraham see these three men, to see these three men walking by and say that this is not normal? Like these are not just three regular men walking by, but these are angels. These are messengers of the Lord God. And I cannot let these messengers go by me. I have to stop them. How many of you all have favor going by you right now, but you have, you have incorrectly named that normal? How do you know it's favor? Because it's not normal. Opportunities, people, places that you normally would not have access to is now within your reach. You have access to something that you normally would not have access to. This is favor in your miss. This is favor in your miss. 
How many of you are, uh, are walking by people at the mall? I know we they say don't be a groupie and don't be up in people's faces, but it's people and not just a celebrity person, but a person that you know can help you get to your next place. See, this is what favor does. There's a gap. This is you. This is your next place. There is a gap. And so you need God's favor to fill in the gap to get you from here to there. And you meet a person that you know can help you get there. You, you come into a situation that you know is the right situation to get you to where you need to be. You have an opportunity to do something that you know is the missing link to get you there. You don't come into rooms and come around great people and get opportunities and say, well, I don't know. I don't know. Should I? Should I? Should I? If you don't think it's your time, you're going to always miss favor. And let me tell you something. Every time favor presents, that is time. If you ever have a question about the timing of something, the fact that God lets something unusual happen is God saying, now, 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 now's the time, now's the time, now's the time, move, 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 go, go, go. If you cannot feel the nudging of the Lord, oh, I feel him, I feel him in here. I feel him, I feel him, glory, glory. God says, I'm giving you a nudging. Some of us are so religious. I'm just going to wait on the Lord. I need I need confirmation. I need to go on a prayer fast and confirm that this is the Lord. That's why you keep missing opportunities. That's why you're stuck. And that's why you're standing in front of a gap. And you cannot cross over because you sit around being deep when there's no need to be deep. Why would the devil present you with an opportunity to increase you to your next place? The opportunities that the devil increase that the devils present may increase you in the natural, but it's going to always kill you in the spirit. So if God is presenting you with an opportunity that's going to bring him glory and increase your life and increase your spiritual life, then that's not the devil. You don't have to discern it. I mean, you know when something's going to increase you for life and when you know something's going to increase you, that's going to kill you. And if you can't discern that, then that's something that you got to get in deeper in your prayer life so that you can discern good and evil. But guess what? You don't really need a deep life to know good and evil. It's in us naturally, the Bible says. We know what's good. We know what's evil. It's in us innately to know it. It's our decision to believe it and to be governed by good or to be governed by evil. And the Holy Spirit helps us to always yield to good even when our flesh wants bad. Right? So if you're sitting up trying to discern if this experience is from God or not, then you got a deeper problem going on. And some of y'all has let religion put you in a prison and you begin to speak death over favor opportunities that God has provided. Well, I don't know if it's my time. What did you just speak? You just said that this time that God presented is now not your time. My God. Well, I don't know if that's the Lord. The Lord clearly sent this, and now you're questioning if it is the Lord. He says, well, if you can't discern that this is me, I'll pass right on by. Don't let favor pass you by. And here's another thing. You have to be living, constantly looking for favor. Now, I know there's a song that says, I'm looking for a miracle. Well, I'm not necessarily looking for miracles. Because miracles, let me, and I say that a lot, and I want to clarify that. The only time that I really want a miracle is when I'm in a crisis situation that only God's divine intervention can get me out of. And those times, I gladly welcome miracles because there are going to be times when your back is pressed against the wall, you're in crisis, all hell is breaking loose, you need God's divine intervention, right? For those that's in the eye of that storm, that hur uh, the hurricane Irma, they need a miracle. People that's in Houston, some of them need a miracle. They're not getting FEMA assistance. All kinds of things are going on in Houston if you've been following it. Those people need a miracle from God. So absolutely, I believe in miracles when you're in crisis. But I'm not looking for miracles because looking for miracles in my everyday life is welcoming crisis into my life. I am looking for favor. See, notice. Notice the biblical kingdom model for what we should be looking for. We should be looking for favor. Not even blessings. Some of y'all are looking for blessings. I'm looking for favor. Abram had his eyes set to recognize when favor opportunities was on his scene. My God, are you living your everyday life looking for favor opportunities, favor moments, things that God has orchestrated to get you to where you need to be? 
favor. We should be looking for favor, not just blessings. We should be looking for favors, not miracles. We are looking for favor. And if you're not living your life looking out for favor, then you're going to see something unusual happen. You're going to say, oh, that's weird. And it keep right on moving with your life. Your spirit ain't going to say, hey, 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 don't miss that moment. Hey, 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 pay attention. This is the Lord. This is the Lord. This is the Lord. This is a favor moment that has been put in your face to move you closer to where God wants you to be. So he recognized them. They didn't identify themselves. Once he recognized them, he ran out to meet them. So notice, they're in your reach, but you have to go to it. So you can't be sitting there, let's say you're sitting in the lobby at the airport, and this has happened to me before. I saw a great man of God that I admired for years in the airport. I saw him. I was in his in his area. But if I did not go to him and introduce myself and start talking to him, then the connection would not have been made. Some of y'all get deep again. Well, Lord, if it's if it's you, let them come talk to me. Really? Really? Let them come talk to me if that's the Lord. It don't work like that. You get a you're in a you're in a meeting. And you and you hear an opportunity that is available that you know is exactly what you need. Well, Lord, if it's for me, let them come over and present it to me. And would you want God to supernaturally take your hand and fill out the application? Really? Is that what you want? Stop this foolishness, saints. You got to go to it. God has laid the stage. He's brought it close enough, but you got to go get it. He could have seen the angels and said, wow, those are angels from the Lord. And said, okay, well, Lord, if it's meant for them, let them come down here to my tent. We, let me tell you, the kingdom is not McDonald's, if that's a word. We try to treat the kingdom like it's McDonald's. The kingdom is not McDonald's. And nothing against McDonald's because I go to McDonald's. But what I'm saying is that you cannot expect God to bring everything to your face. We want everything handed to us, put in our lap. It doesn't work like that. That's right, Tanya. Faith without works is dead. You got to have works, but it has to be birthed out of faith. Go to it. Go to it. Go introduce yourself. Go ask questions about the program. Fill out the application. When you get information, move on it. Some of y'all get information and it's two months later before you don't move on it. And then they tell you the moment has passed by because opportunity is time sensitive. Don't miss that. Favor is time sensitive. The opportunities that God present to you are time sensitive. You don't know how long that opportunity is going to be open, but when it closes, that opportunity is closed and you cannot get access because it's closed. Those men were only in front of his tent for a set amount of time. If he had to let those men go down the street and then say, oh, wait a minute, that was favor. I should have went to them and went up and go running. Those men would have been gone and he would have missed his moment. Get up out of your tent. Get up out of wherever you are and go and possess this moment and this opportunity that God has provided for you. He ran out of his tent. And when he got there, he fell on his face and he worshiped. Verse two, in a verse two, he bowed himself to the ground. And that obeisance is an act of worship, is an act of recognizing the authority that's in your midst, that the person that's in my midst is of higher authority and rank than I. And my act that I respect and honor this great moment and this great person is that I bow myself. I say, I'm not on your level. I'm not your equal. I'm not your commiserate, but I lower myself as a sign to recognize that there's a difference and I am appreciative to even be in the presence of someone greater. Now, listen, you're not worshiping the person. He wasn't worshiping the angels. He was worshiping the God of the angels. He was honoring the God of the angels. Angels, remember, are messengers. So they were sent to represent God. Some of you all have to recognize that when God brings you in front of great people, they are messengers of God. They are representatives of God. God is using them. Even if they are a heathen, God is using them to facilitate this moment to get you to where you need to get. And you need to respect them as representatives, but you need to worship and honor God. 
You need to let him know in your spirit. God, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. I want to praise you, God, for bringing me into this moment. You didn't have to do this for me. You could have did this for my neighbor. You could have did this for the person across the street. But God, you chose. Oh, I feel God. I feel like running. God, you chose me. <laughs> Glory to the Lamb. <laughs> you chose me. You chose me to give me this opportunity. And I'm not going to let this opportunity pass me by. I'm not going to let this moment pass me by because you chose me. And I'm going to worship you. I'm going to praise you. And I'm going to honor you in the midst of this. Some of us, like I said on Sunday, we're too proud for God to give us favor. We too, we too cool. We too cool for school for God to give us favor because he opens the door and you're like, oh, okay, whatever. Oh yeah, he did this. Okay, that's great. Come on, come on, come on. We got to get our spirits in check and make sure that we're not acting too cool to show our appreciation for God for opening up the moment. And then in the natural, let's do that in the natural. God brings you in front of a millionaire and you're going to act like they're just some Joe off the street. No. You be like, sir, you know, I, I appreciate you and I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your time. I'm not going to waste your time because I know time is valuable. And you get straight to saying what you have to say. You don't be up there like, oh, what's up, man? What's up, homie? You don't walk up to no men and talk about, what's up, man? What's up, homie? Even if they say to you, what's up, man? How you doing? They could be cool like that. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? No, you be like, thank you. I'm doing good, sir. Thank you. No, you respect them because a lot of times that is a test. To see if you will become too common with someone that you don't even know that's not on your level. That's just a little nugget I feel like giving you there. You need to keep that in mind. Some of y'all get too common too fast with people that you don't even know. Okay. So he he runs out. He bows himself to the ground. Right? And he says, if I have now found favor in your sight, right? do not pass your servant by. Verse 3. My Lord. Now, Lord there is Adonai. He didn't, he didn't use Jehovah. He did not use Elohim. He used Adonai, which is the word for master. He is recognizing the authority of this moment. Again, you have to recognize, see, favor, the doorway to favor. Now, what says the sage for favor is covenant. But the doorway then by which you access favor is your ability to recognize the authority of the ones God has used. You recognize their authority and you recognize that they're in a place that you are not. But clearly God wants you to be there. But you got to recognize their authority. He said, Lord, Adonai, if I have now found favor in your sight, know this. That the favor moment does not start when you see it. Favor starts when you go to it and you worship and recognize the authority. That's when the now happens. Notice, he didn't say now in the tent. He didn't even say now when he bowed. He said now after he recognized the authority of the person who has created this opportunity. And some of us, you may see your favor. You may have come up on your favor, but if you have not recognized the authority of the one who has given you the favor, you cannot say now. See that? My Lord, Adonai, if I have now found favor, notice he did not presume that he had it. He still had to get it. We can never assume and presume that we have anything. We have the confidence that is ours by faith. But our posture, there it is, our posture has to be a humble posture. It has to be a humble posture. You cannot be arrogant in these favor opportunities. Humility will take you a long way. So the Bible says that God opposes the proud, but he gives what? Grace to the humble. He gives favor to the humble. Notice, Abram is humble. This man is already wealthy. He's already prosperous. But he had the ability to humble himself in the presence of this great opportunity. And some of us, 
You know, we are not in that place yet, but yet we can't humble ourselves. Sometimes the people who act the most arrogant and uppity, so to speak, are the people who really don't have anything. It's just all a pretense to be truthful. But we can't be pretentious in the presence of favor. We have to be humble. And we have to say, if I've now found favor, you know in yourself that it's yours, but you present yourself in such a humble, grateful fashion. God will give favor to humble, grateful people. He's not giving favor to arrogant, haughty, um, entitled people who think that they deserve it and that it's theirs automatically. Mm -mm. It is a process. Notice that getting favor is a process. That's why people talk about, I got favor. They can't have it because you're not willing to go through nothing to get it. You're arrogant. You're haughty. Right? Your spirit is off. You, I mean, how can you say you're walking in the favor of God and you, and you can't even humble yourself? You don't even lift your hands in worship. <laughs> you ain't said hallelujah in, in weeks because you think that everything you're getting, you deserve. That's not favor. You better check the source from which you're getting your stuff because that's not from God. All right. So notice a connection between favor and sight. If I have now found favor in your sight. So sight there is in reference to the presence, the eye of. If I've now found favor in the sight of the Lord. Right? So in order to be able to access this favor, you must be in the presence of the Lord. So opportunities that come are also indications that the presence of God is there, which is very important to kind of to, to, uh, drill down into. I'm not talking about you got to be at church to access the favor. No, it's not about being at church. Remember that God is here, there, and everywhere at the same time. The presence of God is with us right now. When we talk about the sight of the Lord, we're talking about a manifestation of the presence of God. In, in theology, these angels showing up at Abraham's tent is what we would call a theophany, right? A theophany, T-H-E-O-P-H-A-N-Y. Put that up for me, Yolanda. Theophany, right? A theophany is a physical manifestation of God. We know that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, but God will manifest himself and physical ways to let us know that he is there. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. I declare and decree that you have some theophanic experiences this week, that God will manifest himself in your presence through the opportunities that he's getting ready to provide for you. Theophany, T-H-E-O, P as in Paul, H-A-N-Y, theophany. This is a theophany. Angels, the physical manifestation of God. So you've got to recognize that when God manifests himself, that when you have theophanic experiences, that God's presence is in your midst. I feel him in the room right now. Do you feel him where you are? I feel Jesus in the room. Hallelujah. And when you recognize that you have this theophanic experience, you need to understand that the sight of the Lord is there. His eyes are present in the moment. He's listening and he's watching to hear what it is you have to say. So what was his request? If I've now found favor in your sight, do not pass your servant by. You need to put a demand for it to abide. Favor will pass by you if you don't put a demand on it to stay. <laughs> you want that favor to stay so that you can make your request. You want him to stay so that you could be in the presence. And you know what? Let me correct what I just said. When favor abides, you don't have to make a request because favor knows what you need already. Oh, wow. So no, you want it to stay so that favor can speak because favor talks. Oh my God, write that down. Favor speaks, but you got to let it be around you long enough for it to speak to you. So when he says, hey, if, you, if I found favor, don't pass me by. I want to go get you some water to wash your feet. And I want to bring you some morsel of bread that you may refresh your heart, which means that you may eat. And, and, and then after that, you know, 
You do what you want to do. And they said, go do it. Whatever's in your heart to do, go do it. So notice, when you have favor in front of you, you have gone to it. You are worshiping God for it. You're recognizing the authority of the people that God is using. You put a demand for it to abide, which means you are asking for audience. That's another way of asking for audience. Can I have audience with you? Can I have a moment of your time? <laughs> Can I spend some time with you? I just want to, I just want to pick your brain. I want to spend some time with you. But notice, he didn't come empty-handed. He understood that serving will always make favor abide long enough to speak. See, some of y'all want favor to stay and you ain't got nothing to give. Come on. God will always give audience to a servant. There it is. God will always give audience to a servant. The question is, are you a servant or are you looking to be served? Abraham was willing to serve in the presence of God. Why, do, why did he serve? He served because he was so grateful for this opportunity that he knows he didn't deserve. Are you grateful for the opportunities that God has given you because you know the truth that you don't deserve it? You're not qualified for it, but God gave it to you out of his love. And because of that, you are willing to serve. What do you have to give to demonstrate your appreciation for this moment? You may say it's not much, but it don't have to be much. It's all about the posture of your heart. All he had was some water and bread. And the angel said, I'll stay. Come on. It wasn't about the fact that it was fine linen and, and, and top level uh, sheep and and all this, no, it was nothing fancy. Water and bread. But the gesture, and notice his language. Can I get some water to wash your feet? <laughs> that was a sign of hospitality. Because in those days, they walked with sandals in the dust. And the dirt would get all up in their feet. And when they would come to their house, they said, we're going to bring some water. They would wash your feet, just like Jesus washed the feet of his disciple. Come on here which was one of the lowest things to do in that time. Masters didn't wash feet. The servants washed feet. And here is Abel, who was a master, who was wealthy, who had a covenant with God. Not, not, not ashamed to get down on his knees and to wash the dirty feet of these angels. He removed himself from a position of master and he put himself in the position of a servant to demonstrate his gratefulness for this opportunity. He says, I want you to rest yourself under the tree. He was under the tree, but he removed himself under the tree to accommodate these messengers of God. He said, I'm going to bring you a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. Listen to the language. And that you may pass by in as much as you have come to your servant. They said, do it. In other words, he says, I know you've come for a reason, but let me serve you and make you comfortable so that you can do what it is you've come to do for your servant. We can never get so busy in the presence of God that we're not willing to serve. But I want to talk about this. And I had this experience this week. I had a favor, a great favor opportunity this week. I had a great favor opportunity that I thought was going to open up a door. And after having this conversation, having an audience with this particular person, it didn't open the door that I thought it was. But it gave me access to information to get me to where I need to go. Now, you may be saying, but I thought you was declaring the favor of God and you were decreeing the favor of God and favor breaks the rule. But you know, God showed me something in that and I see it in the text. In order for favor to take you from point A to point B, you got to have something to get you there. Even though Elohim could take nothing and make something, favor needs something to work with. Some of y'all are asking God to break rules for you and you don't even have anything for God to use to break the rule with. The nothing to something is in creation, right? God will create stuff to help you get there. But in order for favor to take you from point A to point B, you must have something. Notice, Abram had water and bread to offer. If Abraham did not have water and bread to offer, 
that he would not have the means to demonstrate hospitality to the servants. Now, God wasn't going to just manifest water and bread out of the sky for Abram. Abram had to already have bread and water. Bless you, Bishop. He had to already have it. Hear me. Hear me. Some of us are asking for God to give us favor, but we also want him to give us the stuff. No, you got to have the stuff, which means that favor only comes to bridge the gap between you having what you need, but also needing the opportunity. See, you have what you need for the next place. You just need the opportunity. You just need the connection. And here's what you really need sometimes. You just need exposure to information. Some of y'all are looking for stuff when you need information. Because let me tell you something about information. When you got that information in your head, nobody can take it from you. They can take stuff from you, but they can't take what's in your head. And when you have it in your head and you understand the mechanics of it and how to use that thing, they can take it, but you can get it again. But you got to have something. Abraham had water and bread. And my question is, stop asking God for stuff that you don't even have for opportunities and moments. And you don't even have anything in your hand for favor to work with. You got to have something. Which means, are you preparing yourself? Are you gathering the experiences, the information, the knowledge? So that when God creates these favor moments in your life, you have something for favor to work with. You have something to offer. You've got to be able to recognize that. Now, I'm going to close with this. I'm going to close with this. All right. Hey, Lady Toy, good to see you. Favor, when you have accommodated it, you're serving it, you've asked it to abide. Favor will speak. Let me say this. Favor, when favor shows up on your life, it's coming on an assignment. So favor is going to do what it's going to do once the proper conditions have been set. And we've talked about these conditions tonight. Once the proper conditions are set, favor is going to do what favor does. Favor is going to talk. I want to share quickly, because we're out of time, what favor does. The first thing is that when favor shows up, it will begin to speak prophetically. There will be prophetic activity. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and the prophetic will instantly begin to happen. Look at verse number 9 of Genesis 18. Right? So after Abraham went and made the, made the food, ter Sarah's helping, the servants are helping, they made this food. They came and brought it to the servants. And while he brought the food to them, verse 9, they said, where is Sarah, your wife? <laughs> Wait a minute. How did they know that Sarah is his wife? They know. Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold... Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Sarah and Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. So notice, the prophetic is kicking in. First, word of knowledge. Where's your wife? Call her by her name. Where your wife at? He says she's in the tent. Then he begins to prophesy that I'm going to come again, and I'm going to let you have a child. So the fact that you're going to have a child is going to happen because of favor, because nature says you're too old to have a child, but favor breaks the rules and the favor breaking anointing is going to position you to have what nature says you can't have. Oh, bless his name. Favor knows exactly where you are. Favor knows exactly what you need and favor will tap into that place and it's going to speak about it directly to you. Sarah heard it and laughed. She said, how can I as an old woman have such a thing? And the angel discerned and knew that she laughed and called her out. Don't be in the presence of favor and be walking in doubt. God has created this moment for you that you don't deserve. Otherwise you would have never had and you're going to come up in the presence of favor and you're going to doubt that's why you got to be careful who you're connected to because some of y'all are connected to folks who have been brought to a favor moment because of their connection to you but don't have the faith to properly handle it. But be careful who you let see your favor opportunities. If they don't got the faith to believe God for what he says he can do, they don't need to be in the moment. 
because they could talk you or laugh you out of your favor. Thank God that God was committed to doing this and that Sarah's laughter did not uh, take them out of this opportunity. But what it did do is that it put him in a place to have to constantly be reminded of his doubt because the child's name Isaac means laughter. You laughed. So every time you call your child's name, you're going to be reminded that you doubted what I said I was going to do. All right. This is the other thing that happens. He will give you insight into how he's going to manifest promise. So when favor is on your scene, it will begin to give you details into how God is going to do it. Notice, it takes you from telling you that God is going to do it to giving you insight into how God is going to do it. Verse 10, the way that your seed is going to expand is I'm going to give you and your wife a son. This time next year at the appointed time of conceiving and carrying, you're going to have a child. God is getting ready to give you intimate details and steps into how he's about to manifest his promise in your life. It all happens in the favor, in the presence of favor on your life. So some of y'all been wondering how God is going to do it, how God is going to get you there. It happens in the presence of favor. He begins to give you strategy, information. The conversation I had this week, this man was saying words I've never even heard before in my life. Stuff I've never heard before in my life, but I needed to hear it. I needed to know it because in order for me to get to what God says, let me tell you something. Not only did he say words I didn't know, but the man laid out the roadmap for me. Y'all better hear what I'm saying. He laid out the detailed roadmap. He said, where are you trying to go? What are you trying to do? I told him. He laid out the roadmap. He do this, do that, do this, do this, do this. And I was telling um, some of my leaders on Saturday, and I, I did a, um, a moment with Jackson on this about knowing your street value. The man affirmed my street value without me even asking for it. Come on, Jesus. God's getting ready to give you insight on how he's going to manifest it. And the last thing, and I love this one. You have prophetic activity. You will get insight on how the promise will manifest, but you will also then gain intercessory leverage. Intercessory leverage. After the angels begin to talk about they're going to have a son. They're getting ready to leave, right? Verse 16. Then the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom, and Abram went with them to send them on their way. And the Lord said, now here is Jehovah speaking. Jehovah said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely be a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I would go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me and if not i will know then the men turned away from there and went towards sodom but abram still stood before the lord and abram came near and said would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked the angels in the presence of the lord so as the angels are leaving now the very presence of jehovah himself has manifested <laughs> he goes from messengers to the manifestation of his own presence and begins to speak about Moses in about excuse me about Abram in his presence. Have you ever heard the Lord talk about you in your presence? He wasn't talking to you, but he was talking about you where you could hear it. Can I tell you that favor will talk about you in your presence so you can hear what the Lord thinks about you? But not only will he tell you what he thinks about you, he will begin to reveal what he's getting ready to do somewhere else. So he comes and tells you what he's going to do for you, but then he begins to tell you what he's getting ready to do somewhere else. 
But the place that he's talking about is also connected to you because Abram's uh, nephew Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah. They said, we're going to destroy the cities. It's wicked. We're going to destroy it. Why did he share that with Abel? Now, Abel could have heard that and said, wow, that's messed up. That's messed up. Go ahead and praise him, the Lord. Praise him, elders. That's messed up. But Abram said, wait a minute. My nephew is there, and that is a righteous man. And he came close to them and said, listen, would you destroy a city if righteous people are there? If there were at least 55 righteous people in the city, would you spare 50, excuse me, verse 24. If there were 50 righteous people, would you spare the city? He moved into intercessory leverage. What is intercession? It is to stand in the gap. So notice, he experienced intercession and then he was able to then intercede because favor is a form of intercession. That's so powerful. Write that down. Favor is a form of intercession. Favor stands in the gap to get you where you need to get, but you don't have the ability to get there. So here's the thing. If you have experienced the intercession of favor in your life, how can you then be in a position to be intercession for somebody else and don't do it? If you have been a recipient and a partaker of favor and you have the opportunity to be there for somebody else, then you take advantage of that opportunity. You don't say, oh, I'm sorry for them or I hate that's happening for them. No, you have the information not to be nosy. You're not hearing the information just so you can be in the know. There's a reason why God is providing you with the information. Will you take the opportunity to become an intercessor and begin to say, God, I know you're going to destroy the city, but if there's 50 righteous, God, will you consider it? And notice what happens. They listen to him. They listen. Can I tell you that when you walk in the favor of God and you have covenant with him and you intercede on somebody else's behalf, God will listen to you. And, 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 and listen, this is what tripped me up about that whole story. He worked his way all the way down to one, from 50 to 45 to 40, all the way down. <laughs> I want you to know how powerful you are in God, but it starts with a humble posture. You can't go in thinking you are the baddest thing since sliced bread. You got to go in with a humble posture. And when you go in with a humble posture, God will position you to intercede for somebody else. God will give you advanced knowledge, not just so you can have the knowledge, but so that you can show your gratefulness for the intercession you have received by favor. And now standing in the gap for somebody else. He could have just let his nephew be killed. But because he interceded, he preserved Lot and his entire family. Those that were able to come out. I pray that this has been a blessing to you tonight. I, I, I love teaching on favor and talking about it because I think a lot of people um, don't fully understand what it is. They're just saying, you know, I have favor has become a religious cliche. And favor is not a cliche. Favor is a real reality that God is manifesting for us. But notice that at the end, the favor really isn't just for us. The favor is positioning us so that we can be a blessing to somebody else. So that we can stand in the gap for other people. Right. So make the decision that if you are a person that's walking in the favor of God, you are also a person that is caring about the realities of other people. We got people who have been victims of hurricanes in, in Texas and now in the Caribbean and Florida. What are you going to do to stand in the gap for somebody else? How can you use your favor and your relationship with God to be a blessing to somebody else? The Lord bless you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. The countenance of the Lord rise up upon you. Give you his peace, prosperity, and his favor all the days of your life. In Jesus' name. Have a great night. Come be with me on Friday night as we kick off my pastor appreciation. Seven o'clock, Archbishop Smith will be with us. I'll be also releasing my second book. Sunday morning, Dr. Spark will be with us. Also will be selling books. Uh, wear African attire. If you have it, rock your African attire for the whole weekend. If not, just come as you are. I just want you in the building to help me celebrate three years of pastoring 
at Mount Sinai Church. Do me a favor. Help me share this. Right? We want to have over a thousand views as we've been doing the last few weeks. I know you know somebody that would be blessed by this teaching. Come on, share this. Show this to people. Tell people you need to watch this message. I believe it will be a blessing to them. Have a good night. Bless you, Mother Johnson. Thank you. Give God glory. My sister Denise, God bless you. My brother, Elder Faulkner, how you doing, sir? Bless you. Diane, God bless you so much. God bless you, Yolanda. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. I appreciate that. All right. Good night on conference call. Everybody have a good night.